Thank you. Don't you just love it when poetry works? Um, Martin and I hadn't conferred, um, but my first poem is in fact Yeta, uh, which, as Martin has said, um, came second in uh, this year's Manchester Cathedral Prize. Um, and uh, it's for my son, who is ill. Yeta. A boy sneaks out of his house to go fishing. He's so young he doesn't know he's kidding himself, but his mother does. She hears the stairs creak and looks down from an upper room to see her son following the men to prayer. Should she worry? Not about the prayer, but the questioning, the hand so quickly raised, the slight frown on the boy's face. She wants to call him back. She wants to hold him in her lap, to hug his thin shoulders and boyish knees. The fish he will catch, the bread in his pocket. How much, she wonders, does he already know? And the next poem is for my late father. My father. There was a moment in old age when he grew tired. So tired he could hardly get out of his chair, and more than once he slept in it, in his Sunday jacket, and the day after could not bear himself. This change happened suddenly, as when his favourite painting of a Thames barge under sail slipped sideways on the wall, and there was nothing he or I could do to write it. Now a poem about my own um, beginning encounter with uh, old age. Blackbird. It comes to me slowly, this growing older. The past is closer. The blackbird on her nest, a hand's breadth away. The future further off, its branches bare and tangled in the evening light. Mirrors surprise me with a reflection that's not mine, and yet is so. I stare, puzzled by something new, as all those years ago I stared into the blackbird's eye, not quite believing what I saw. As Martin has noticed, I do write a lot of poems about birds. They creep in everywhere. Uh, Canada geese. They're taking possession of the night. They're bugling audible above the evening traffic with the rhythm of their wings only half heard, as if they might keep from me the art of taking flight by starlight, the moon not yet being risen over Blackstone Edge. I listen, unlearning vision, hear how their wings dip to the canal's thin ebony or the icy glitter of fields under frost. I sense them yield to the bare gleam of lake and reservoir, splashing down in a rainbow of black and silver, even indoors, from inside my pent and curtained house, I hear them. And from real birds to mythical birds, the first time I heard the music by James Macmillan called The Birds of Rhiannon, um, it reminded me very, very strongly of the, um, uh, the scenery, uh, the, the landscape in North Wales around the slate mines and the old spoil heaps and everything. So this is uh, The Birds of Rhiannon, after the music by James Macmillan. The Birds of Rhiannon lament the death of King Bran. It begins with water, pale lobelia trembling in a cold pool, wet sunlight glancing off mounds of fallen slate. Birdsong trickles from an alder. Wings whir softly, black on purple, but spangled blue and gold. Strings hum, woodwinds breathe out a soot streak of wild garlic. Sky grayer now, a soft pattering down of starlings, wind not through withered reeds, but bird bones. A slag heap, a tooth that cannot be pulled. Drums draw down hail, a trumpet nails jackdaws to the branches of a thorn tree. Gall black wings flare in a firework whoosh, thunder sheets shudder, driving the now into a storm. Lightning forks the sky pit, leans broken sickles against rotted sills. Strings pluck a percussive pulse, 
Symbols shriek a piercing yellow. Whoever is ruined will blast the slate beds. Whoever is destroyed will be filled with song. Loud, loud, a fit of Corvid screaming. The burn, the carrion, the clench. The birds are a gash, a gloom. The birds, or the birds black of the day. Now a couple of poems from where I live. I live in Littleborough in the South Pennines. Um, I read recently, I think it was um, an American poet saying, if you um, really want to be a poet, you must do the same walk every day for 10 years. Um, so I'm three years into uh, <laughs> walking the canal towpath um, where, where I live. Um, but this one, uh, Equinox, is the view from my kitchen window. Equinox. Snow clouds roll over Blackstone Edge, pale and allegorical. I miss the sight of gritstone boulders, Thackeray walls, spring sunlight counting sheep. Bailing hay. At the same time as the swallows are lining up to leave, a man's under the bridge bailing hay. It's a simple thing, this baler. A wooden box upended, a tamping block a solid lump of oak. The man lifts the hay into the box and pushes it down with his hands. When the box is full, he pulls the wooden lever and the block drops down with a satisfying thud. The contraption shudders as though a train has passed over the bridge. He pulls the lever again. The pivot squeaks like a swallow chittering on a wire. The man opens the box. He lifts out the bale and stacks it neatly under the bridge. By the day's end, he will have done what he came to do, raked warm, dry grass from the field and turned it into something useful. Like the swallows, he knows the cold is returning. I've recently got very interested uh, in the history of the navvies who built the railway line near where I live. It's a very early railway line. It was started in 1839 and completed in 1841. Um, and um, the working conditions were appalling. And uh, many men died. And um, I'm attempting to write a poem about their lives as a kind of memorial to them. Because they were not well thought of. They were incomers, they were Scots, and they were Irish. Um, and they were mucky, um, as you would be if you're digging holes in hills. Um, and um, in the way of Victorian intellectuals, everybody had something to say about them. And uh, Thomas Carlyle said, And not without glad surprise, I find the Irish are best in point of behaviour. The poem is called Blasphemous and Depraved. Summer nights he sits for hours scanning the moon's scarred face for the likeness of his own blotched soul. He's bad. He knows it but not so bad as they would have him be. Ungodly, they call him, for he's neither temperate nor dissenting. But what's a man to do who lives like a rat in a ruthless sewer? He sleeps in shadows chipped out by dip candles, curls up on rubble, each lump of stone a grappling iron. But he's still in the habit of prayer. His hands know how to do it, even without beads. Ungodly? What do they know? And now two poems um, from Holy Island, the island of Lindisfarne, where I've been taking my holidays for uh, more than 40 years now. Um, as I expect you know, Lindisfarne is a tidal island. Um, and uh, um, in olden days, you used to have to walk or take a cart across the sands, and that's known as the Pilgrim's Way. Um, but now you go across by, by road. The Pilgrim's Way. Sometimes you need only to stand on the shore to be blessed. But much is contained in that word only. The temporary abandonment of daily life. The journey along the long road to the north. The motorway sluiced with filthy rain. And the food unsatisfactory. And then the patient wait for the sea to turn its back on the island. A pilgrimage of sorts, even now. Some of it trying or tedious, but worth it. For the shimmer of silver mudflats, 
and the slow unravelling of thought. Nothing but arrival and the unwilled rhythms of the tide. The little castle on Lindisfarne, which um, used to be a garrison in uh, Georgian times, uh, was uh, refurbished by the architect uh, Edward Lutyens um, in the uh, early part of the 20th century. And it, it is exquisite. If you do go to the island, do go in the castle. It's lovely. The first two lines of this poem are a quotation from a poem by the Orkney poet George Mackay Brown. The poem's called How Lutyens Learned to Let in Light. In such granite rock, how shall a house be built? A fulmar lit on dolorite, and found in drag back of pinions an under heaven home. The rooms hollow boned as hawks, the stairs leaning seaward as if to fly. And finally, um, a poem from one of my other favourite places, which is, um, I think, becoming my signature poem. Um, I quite often go up to Brantwood, um, the former home of uh, John Ruskin on, on Lake Coniston. It's a beautiful house, and, um, exquisitely beautiful grounds around it. Um, and uh, there is a little lime tree, no bigger than me, um, which is um, believed to be about a thousand years old in the grounds. Brantwood, small leaved lime. What if, in growing, I hollowed out? I am the hill as it is me. Our roots grope, careless but stubborn. And if sometimes on our shoulders, sunlight, well then, a mingling of clouded yellows, the small pale flowers barren, for I know nothing of seed, its setting and striving upwards. I live in the old, unimaginable way. What if, in hollowing out, my growing is?